Skeptics. The World Skeptics Congress, Paranormal, Supernatural, Fringe Science, Pseudoscience and How It Really Is. Berlin welcomes you. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Harriet Hall, uh, well known by, I hope, all of you as the Skepdoc by her publications, uh, also in the Skeptical Inquirer, in the Skeptic. She's very active also on the health fraud mailing list and also uh, as an advisor of uh, Quackwatch and last but not least, a fellow of CSI. Please, Dr. Harriet. I'm going to be talking today about fairy tale science and placebo medicine. Now, uh, by definition, alternative medicine consists of things that are not taught in medical school. And I've made a list of some of the things that were not taught in my medical school. In fact, when I graduated, I'd never even heard of most of the things on this list. I'd heard of chiropractic and acupuncture, but I didn't really have any understanding of what they were all about. And you may notice that some of the things on this list are reasonable, like herbal remedies. And some of them are just batshit crazy, like... <laughs> Uh, sticking lighted candles in your ears and drinking your own urine. And it used to be uh, we had na different names for different things like quackery or folk medicine. But around 1970, a new name was born, alternative medicine. It was an umbrella term that uh, kind of lumped everything on that list together, regardless of, of how reasonable or silly it was. And uh, in the 1990s, um, you started hearing about complementary medicine and along with it, integrative medicine. But these are marketing terms, not meaningful scientific categories. My colleague Stephen Novella says it's an artificial category created for the purpose of promoting a diverse set of dubious, untested, or fraudulent health practices. And it's an excellent example of the successful use of language as a propaganda tool. You know, there's really no such thing as alternative medicine. There's only treatments that have been tested and proven to work and treatments that haven't. And when something's been tested and proven to work, it's just medicine. So uh, the terminology is unfortunate, but we're stuck with it. Um, I'm going to be calling it CAM for complementary and alternative medicine. Some people hate that name so much that they insist on calling it so-called CAM so that it spells scam. <laughs> But the real question isn't what to call these things, it's whether they work. And I don't think anybody would say that everything on this list works. If they did, they wouldn't be logical because some of these things contradict each other. They couldn't all work. But for everything on this list, there are people who believe that it works. Now, how did they arrive at that belief? Uh, there's a whole smorgasbord of offerings in, in alternative medicine. So how do people choose? How do they go about deciding that something might work for them? Well, here's one way they decide. <laughs> I, I wish this were a joke, but it isn't. People take pendulums into the store and they hold them over different bottles of vitamins and remedies and they let the pendulum tell them which one is right for them. And some people ask their muscles. Uh, applied kinesiology is a bogus muscle testing technique that chiropractors use to diagnose allergies and to determine treatments. And some of them think it works by proxy. In this picture, the chiropractor is testing this little girl by testing the muscle strength in her, mus her mother's arm. Uh, some people ask a biofeedback device. Uh, these devices measure electrical skin conductance and they hook it up to a computer and they ask you a series of yes or no questions and your body tells the computer uh, which, uh, what's out of balance and it tells the uh, operator which homeopathic remedies to sell you. Some people go by tradition or ancient wisdom. Here uh, this doctor is trying the traditional method of, of, of leeches. Um, ancient wisdom, the, the argument is, well, people have been using it for centuries and they wouldn't still be using it if it didn't work. But if you'll think about astrology for a minute, you'll see what's wrong with that argument. Something could be ancient wisdom, but it might just as well be ancient stupidity. 
And some people go by authority and expert opinion. Paracelsus was the authority and he wrote this textbook and for centuries people followed his advice to balance the humors with bloodletting. That didn't work out very well. One of the problems with getting uh, expert opinions is people often don't know who the real experts are and they end up getting their advice from celebrities and charlatans. And some people believe advertising. It says, I don't know what this medication does, but the commercials for it are really cool. Uh, and the label says clinically proven, so gee, it must work. Uh, the Romans coined the term caveat emptor, but we still haven't learned that lesson. People are very susceptible to the uh, seduction of advertising, so much so that there's a whole advertising uh, industry built around our gullibility. Some people trust the experience of others. Here, try this, it worked well for me. And some people f insist on trying things yourself. He says, I should know, I've had six wonderful marriages. <laughs> uh, people say anything might work and the only way to find out is to try it for yourself, which sort of sounds like it makes sense, but if you try something and you get better, you don't know if it was the treatment that made you better or if you might have gotten better anyway without it. So all of these methods of finding out what works are unreliable, except one. The scientific method is the only reliable way. Uh, Drew and Birch in this book called it medicine's beautiful idea, the idea that even the most reasonable sounding theories have to be subjected to tests. I don't think I need to convince this audience that science is important, but I'll just remind you that because of the way our brains evolved, uh, we have some flaws in our thinking. Uh, we prefer stories to statistics. We're prone to cognitive flaws and biases and perceptual failings, psychological motivations, and these flaws systematically lead us to false conclusions. And science is the only method that systematically controls for these biases and flaws. But science is a tool, and any tool can be misused, and sometimes science can mislead us. A doctor named Ioannidis wrote a wonderful study showing that most published findings of clinical trials are wrong and explaining why factors like bias and poor research design, even fraud. He also showed that when you study implausible treatments, you're more likely to get false positive results. And we know now that you should never study one, never trust the results of one study. Studies need to be replicated. And quite often you end up with some studies that say it works and other studies that say it doesn't work. And then you resort to meta-analyses and systematic reviews to break the tie. But systematic reviews are fallible. For one thing, the GIGO principle, garbage in, garbage out. If you have a, a lot of unreliable studies, you don't get any more reliable by adding the data together. And systematic reviews disagree with each other. Out of 11 reviews of homeopathy, nine of them said it didn't work, and two of them said it did. The one that was the most positive uh, said, homeopathy works better than placebo overall, but it doesn't work better for any specific condition. Now, that, that's just statistical shenanigans. It's like saying broccoli is good for everyone, but it's not good for men or women or children. <laughs> Now, the evidence-based mov uh, medicine movement is wonderful in principle, but there are some flaws in the way it gets applied. They've set up a hierarchy of evidence where uh, test tube and animal studies are at the bottom and it works its way up to the double-blind randomized control trial. But there's something missing, and that's uh, evidence against something working from basic science, where uh, basic science says that it's improbable or impossible. This is a blind spot in the way evidence-based medicine is, is uh, implemented. Uh, it seems to worship clinical trial evidence above all else. If they can find a positive study, that's evidence. Um, but it gives very little consideration to basic science and it relegates basic science considerations to the lowest form of evidence. It's a blind spot that has contributed to uh, the infiltration of quackery into hospitals and medical schools, and we call that quackademic medicine. Carl Sagan said it best, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So if basic science says something is implausible, we have to set the bar for clinical evidence higher. In order to prove that homeopathy worked, you'd have to have a 
huge body of very strong evidence that would be enough to counteract everything that we think we know today about physics and chemistry and biology that says nature doesn't work that way. There's a, spe a plausibility spectrum. Homeopathy uh, has, is probably about as close to zero as anything you can find. Acupuncture is intermediate. The uh, oriental mumbo jumbo is not very plausible. But you're sticking needles into the skin, and it's, it's plausible that that might cause some physiological effects. Herbal medicine is very plausible because we know that plants produce drugs. That's how the whole science of pharmacology got started. If you're not careful, you can end up doing what I call tooth fairy science. Now, not everyone in this audience may be familiar with the tooth fairy custom, so I'll explain. When a, a child loses a tooth, he leaves it under his pillow at night, and in the morning, the tooth is gone and there's money in its place. And his, his parents tell him, the tooth fairy came. And you can study the tooth fairy. Uh, you can uh, do a study finding out whether the, fairy, the tooth fairy leaves more money to kids if they leave their tooth in a plastic baggie compared to wrapped in a Kleenex. And you can correlate it with parents' income. And gee, you might find out that for some reason, the tooth fairy brings more money to kids from richer families. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And you can use good scientific methods, you can have results that are, are reproducible and statistically significant, and you think you've learned something about the tooth fairy. But you haven't, because there's no such thing as the tooth fairy. You've really been studying uh, popular customs and parental behavior. And there's lots of fairy tales that uh, get studied. Uh, Reiki is a type of faith healing. Homeopathy is essentially sympathetic magic. <coughs> Therapeutic touch, uh, it, it sounds like a misnomer. They're not touching the patient, they're touching the human energy field. They run their hands about six inches off the patient's body and smooth out the wrinkles in the energy field. And when you apply the tools of science to uh, modalities like these that are based on fantasy, you just get a lot of confusing noise. Some examples of fairy tale science on therapeutic touch. Uh, they studied uh, recovery from bypass surgery. And they found that therapeutic touch produced a decrease in anxiety and length of stay, but it didn't do anything else. And they did a lab study where uh, they waved their hands over cell cultures of human bone cells and allegedly found that it affected the DNA synthesis and mineralization. I don't believe that. Uh, in 1996, a little girl needed a project for a school science fair, Emily Rosa. And she got together some nurses who practiced therapeutic touch. And she tested them. She held her hand over their hand and said, can you feel my hum human energy field? And they said, yes. She took her hand away. Can you feel it now? No. Put her hand back. Can you feel it now? Yes. And they were 100% accurate at detecting her human energy field as long as they could see where her hand was. <laughs> but then they did it with a screen between them. And uh, then their accuracy dropped to, to nothing, no better than chance. And uh, this got published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And Emily holds the uh, our Guinness record as the youngest person ever to be published in a medical journal. Uh, it, this is kind of like the story of the emperor's new clothes, where the adults were imagining they could perceive something. And it took a little child to point out that the emperor is naked. An another pitfall in evidence-based medicine is pragmatic studies. When you do clinical trials, you have selection criteria. And your subjects tend to be healthier and on fewer medications than the average person walking into a doctor's office. So once you've proven something works in a clinical trial, you need to put it out into the real world and see how it performs there. Uh, an example is the clot buster drugs. They worked great for strokes in clinical trials, but when they got out into community emergency rooms, they ended up causing more strokes from bleeding complications. And in some studies, they actually did more harm than good. Now, pragmatic trials uh, are really not appropriate for CAM treatments. They were intended to evaluate real-world use of treatments that had already been proven to work in clinical trials. And they, there's, they're not designed to provide any objective evidence that a treatment works better than placebo. But CAM advocates love pragmatic trials because it allows them to bypass the first step of proving that it works. 
and it allows placebo effects to shine and it, uh, it makes CAM methods look better than they really are. Uh, you could do a pragmatic trial comparing acupuncture to usual care for low back pain and acupuncture might win. But does that prove that acupuncture is really more effective? Well, no, that's what I call Cinderella science. Let me explain. On the left, there's Cinderella and her rags and ashes. On the right, there's her ugly stepsister, and she got a complete makeover, and wow, look at her. Uh, let's say it's the fairy godmother didn't get there in time, and Cinderella had to go to the ball in her rags and ashes. Well, the stepsister who's had the makeover is going to attract the prince's attention, not the Cinderella. But that's, that's not a fair competition, because to be fair, you ought to compare Cinderella and her rags and ashes to the before stepsister. Either that or compare the fairy godmother enhanced Cinderella to the makeover enhanced stepsister. And uh, let's say you do this pragmatic trial of acupuncture for low back pain. When you get usual care, what might happen? Well, you go into your doctor's office and he says, oh yeah, you've got one of those back aches. Everybody gets those. We don't know what causes them, but they usually go away in two or three weeks. And if you want, I can give you a prescription for some pain pills or a referral to physical therapy. And he, he may act very bored and he may be rushed and he probably won't even tell you to come back for follow-up. And then you go to an acupuncturist and he says, oh yes, I know what's wrong with you and I can fix it. And he goes into a big explanation about yin and yang and meridians and chi. And maybe you don't understand it, but it sure sounds like, like he knows what he's talking about. And uh, he takes you into a quiet back room and has you lie down and relax. And he spends half an hour working on you up close and personal. Uh, he may be very interested in you and ask you about other parts of your life. He may find that you have headaches too, so he may add a couple of needles to his regimen to take care of that problem. And when he's through, he doesn't ask if you feel better. He says, you feel better now, don't you? And you not only feel a social pressure to say yes, but you do feel better because you've been lying down and relaxing for half an hour. And uh, he wants you to make a follow-up appointment. Not one follow-up appointment, but maybe a series of two or three a week for the next three months. So uh, I think of uh, usual care as being like Cinderella in her rags and ashes. What you see is what you get. And acupuncture, if you could just use the needles alone and look for a specific effect of treatment, like put the patient in a box and have a computer stick the needles in, that would be like the before stepsister. But the whole package of acupuncture that you get is like the after stepsister. You, uh, you've got all the nonspecific effects and the human interactions with the practitioner that, that confuse the issue. Now, I love the German language because you get to glue little words together to make big ones. So tooth, <laughs> tooth fairy science becomes Sanfewissenschaft. <laughs> Cinderella science is Aschenputelwissenschaft. <laughs> And the pragmatic trial for back pain might be Rückenschmerzenaschenputelwissenschaft. <laughs> okay, now, the Cochrane system is the gold standard of, of studies, uh, uh, systematic reviews for evidence-based medicine. And they'll study almost anything. Uh, they don't care if it's a fairy tale or not as long as there are studies out there that they can analyze. And they studied therapeutic touch and their conclusion was Therapeutic ther touch therapies may have a modest effect in pain relief. We need more studies. And they say this for almost everything they evaluate. We need more studies. Um, they even studied intercessory prayer. Here are the crew members saying, uh, let's see, Dear Heavenly Father, keep me from ripping his condescending pointy ears off. <laughs> I don't think intercessory prayer protects pointy ears, and I don't think it does much for medical conditions. But people have studied it, and Cochrane uh, found that there wasn't enough evidence to say yes or no. But they said, we are not convinced that further trials of this intervention should be undertaken. For once, they didn't say we need more studies, and they suggested that the money would be spent better elsewhere. And to that I say, amen. <laughs> Now, the bottom line is that when one's common sense science-based standard is applied, almost all of CAM collapses and crumbles to dust. 
And Bausel, in his book Snake Oil Science, said there is no compelling credible scientific evidence to suggest that any CAM treatment benefits any medical condition or reduces any medical symptom, pain or otherwise, better than a placebo. And here's the stages of reasoning. The CAM advocates started out saying, we don't need science. We know it works. We've got plenty of testimonials. We've seen it work on our patients. But uh, they soon realized that uh, people were not going to take them seriously unless they could show some science. So they said, let's do science. But they started off on the wrong foot because instead of asking if X works, they set out to prove to other people that X works. And they collected some proof and the critics said, well, those are not very good quality studies. So they went back and did better studies. And unfortunately, the better the study, the worse results. And finally, uh, they ended up with pretty good quality evidence that showed that their treatment was no better than placebo. Now, in regular science, that would mean uh, they, they would throw out the treatment, but CAM people don't throw out their treatments. They just say, well, maybe even if it's only a placebo, placebos are good, so let's use it. You know, amazing things have been uh, claimed for the placebo effect. This writer even claims that placebos prove the existence of God. Um, I've heard people say that one third of all diseases can be cured by placebo. Well, that's nonsense. Placebos might help with pain, but they don't cure cancer. But do placebos work? Well, in 1955, Beecher did a study where uh, he looked at trials that had compared active treatments to placebo. And he found that across the board, there was about a 35% improvement in the placebo groups. But that wasn't all placebo response, because some of those people would have gotten better anyway just by the natural course of the disease with no treatment. So in 2001, this researcher whose name I won't even try to pronounce, uh, did a study where he looked at, at uh, trials that had included a no treatment group, and he compared the placebo group to the no treatment group. He found that there was no placebo effect except for pain and for maybe for nausea. And when people respond to a, a placebo for pain, something is happening because we can see changes on neuroimaging studies. And there's a group under Fabrizio Benedetti that's studying the neurophysiology of the placebo response. And it's important that we understand that because placebo effects are an integral part of every interaction between a doctor and a patient. But that doesn't mean that it's clinically useful to give people sugar pills. Placebo responses are learned. Uh, a newborn baby doesn't have any idea that taking a pill could relieve pain. That's something they have to learn. And we, can, we respond to conditioning, like Pavlov's dogs. He says, watch <coughs> what I can make Pavlov do. Uh, as soon as I drool, I can make him write in his little book. <laughs> And people say that uh, a treatment <laughs> must be better than a placebo because it works on animals. Well, that's not really true. Animals respond to attention and touch. And their owners know they're being treated, and the owners may behave differently towards them. And conditioning works in animals, and animals can't talk and tell us how they feel. It's the owners who have to interpret their response. So how about this argument? Even if it's only placebo, why not use it anyway? Placebos make people feel better, and that's good. Looks like the placebo has helped your depression. Great, give me a double dose next time. <laughs> well, that sounds reasonable, because we do want patients to feel better. And this was a study they did on asthma patients. Uh, the column on the left is patients who were given a, a, uh, an active uh, drug, an albuterol inhaler. The two columns in the middle are placebos. One of them was a placebo inhaler and one was a sham acupuncture procedure. And the bar on the right is a control group that got no treatment at all. And you look at this and you say, wow, the placebos work just as well as the active drug for symptoms. But we don't just want patients to uh, feel better, we want them to be better. And when uh, when we looked at a, a, um, an objective measurement of lung function, look what happened here. The albuterol group had a significant response, and the placebo groups were no better than the control group. So um, this is a problem because asthma attacks can be fatal. And if you don't realize how severe your attack is, you might not get emergency treatment in time. You might die. 
So uh, here are some other arguments against placebos. The big thing for me is that lying is unethical. It destroys the trust in the doctor-patient relationship. The effects of placebo are unpredictable, they are small in magnitude, and they tend not to last for very long. Using placebos can result in harm, it can waste time and money, it can delay or, or prevent getting effective treatment. And when you start believing false claims, it leads to rejection of real science. And it seems to me that placebo treatment ought to be paid for with uh, placebo payment. The coin on the right is the Homer Simpson Euro. <laughs> what really makes me angry is the double standard. Uh, if a drug company develops a new, pa a new pain pill, we'll call it no more pain, they do a, a careful study comparing it to a placebo sugar pill. And it doesn't perform any better than the sugar pill. So should this drug be approved for marketing? Well, I don't think there's any regulatory agency anywhere in the world that would approve a drug for marketing on that kind of information. But when CAM fails to form, perform placebo, they want to use it anyway. So CAM permits fairy tale science and placebo medicine. Evidence-based medicine has one rigorous standard of scientific evidence and doesn't accept placebos. And we think there's something better, science-based medicine where you do evidence-based medicine, but you don't ignore basic science or prior plausibility. Use a little common sense along with it. And we've established uh, a website uh, called Science-Based Medicine. It's a multi-author blog. Uh, we post a new article every weekday. And if you haven't found us yet, I hope you will check it out and, and join us. It would be tacky to end my presentation with a, a commercial for my website, so I'm going to end with a skeptical cartoon. I don't believe we've met. I don't believe you don't believe we've met. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, question time now. Um, I'm a psychologist, and I was wondering. Um, I think uh, when it comes to when you compare to you know medicine, uh, psychotherapy, for example, is uh, usually quite difficult to to study and to rule out bias, and you know can't really do double blind tests. It's quite difficult. Uh, so even the, if this isn't necessarily your field, your main field, do you have any ideas on how to do? better control studies when it comes to psychotherapy. That's a real problem. And as a matter of fact, there's a journal dedicated to that, the Scientific Review of uh, Mental Health Practices. It's put out by the uh, Center for Inquiry. And uh, they, uh, they address that, that very question. And we don't, don't have any good answers, but we're working on it. Since some placebo sort of works, um, could we maybe have doctors uh, have like a side, um, not a doctor per se, but like a side sidekick to the doctor who can spend time talking to the patient and just doing some of the things that acupuncturists, for example, do without the needle stuff and maybe telling them to meditate as a way to uh, maybe enhance either the therapy they're getting from the doctor or just um, in things that we know that they're just going to get better with time. and you really don't want to give them that antibiotic for that viral medicine, but they really want to get something. Maybe to have them get the attention from somebody else uh, next to it, or I don't know, I'm trying to think like, without actually being deceitful, you know, yeah. there are things like meditation that maybe can create the placebo effect where we're not really deceiving the patient because it is a psychological way of producing that effect. Right. Or, that, that's a great idea. And uh, one of the big problems with medical practice is lack of time. And we, we wish we could spend half an hour with each patient like the acupuncturist does. But medicine more and more is a team effort. And you have nurses and auxiliary personnel working with doctors. And they can spend the time and answer the patient's questions and, and do some hand holding and provide some of those, some of those things. So I'll just abuse my microphone to put the question myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like a, once I was driving my car in, in Holland and I heard somebody on the radio saying, since we I use homeopathy, my asthma doesn't bother me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps 
we should not be go so lightly over that giving the patient a good feeling yeah. is really something those CAM practitioners are quite good in. Yeah. Well, how can we improve normal doctors to do it also? Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the whole concept of healing is problematic because uh, I, I heard of a woman who had advanced breast cancer and she'd gone for the, uh, faith healing to that uh, psychic healer, John of God in Brazil. And her breast cancer was progressing and she knew she was gonna die, but instead of saying that didn't work, she said, he healed me. I have come to, to accept my disease and I have been healed in, in another sense. You told me yesterday that uh, in the U.S. the NC camp uh, um, had uh, resulted in no positive uh, studies for uh, for camp. Uh, what has uh, been the impact of this? Uh, has there been a call to lower the standards for camp so that uh, they can be positive after all? Well, the NCCAM has studied a lot of, of CAM modalities, and they really haven't come up with any uh, important data. They've, they've shown that a lot of things didn't work, but they won't come out and say that that didn't work. They'll say, uh, we need more studies. And they've hardly found any positive results for anything. And uh, when they find that something doesn't work, it doesn't do any good because people don't change their practices. Their, their uh, CAM is built on belief. And uh, just because good studies have, have proven that something doesn't work, people don't accept it. So all that money that's going into research really hasn't accomplished a thing. Do you have any suggestions what could be changed in the training of medical students to make them become more critical as uh, uh, during the last years uh, things like homeopathy, acupuncture and, and so on have also found their place at the universities and they, they are teached as working methods? Yeah. That's a problem because they're, they're trying to teach CAM in medical schools now. Uh, some, of the, some of the medical schools are trying to teach about it so people will know what their, what their patients are, are hearing elsewhere. But they're actually uh, giving training in acupuncture and some of these things as part of the medical school curriculum. And that's terrible. And I, I think by the time you get to medical school, it's too late. I think we need to start by teaching critical thinking at the grade school level and work, work its way up. I'm interested in miracles. Yeah, because that is a kind of the alternative medicine that is doing a lot of damage in my country and uh, in my own continent. Um, I don't know whether you must have heard about TB Joshua and uh, some of uh, Nigeria's uh, prophets and uh, faith healers. I would. Don't you think that there's need also to focus on the danger, the atrocities being committed by faith healers and uh, also sanctioned sometimes by churches based here in Europe? directly and indirectly. Yeah. Don't you think you should, they deserve your own scrutiny to, as part of your work? I certainly agree. And uh, faith healers and uh, pseudoscientific therapies have done a lot of damage in Africa with AIDS. They, they claim to cure AIDS with herbal medicine. And even the health minister in South Africa didn't think that uh, HIV caused AIDS. And yeah, I, I, w I wish we could educate the whole world, but it's no easy answer. <laughs> I think um, part of your um, presentation sort of contradicted what we had heard previously, because you draw a line between one word that is um, the scientific medicine and the other word that is CAM. And, um, and at the same time, you, you say only if evidence is corroborated by scientific knowledge about the mechanism of a treatment's effect, then it ought to be accepted. And I think in, <clears throat> in the real world that may be a bit too harsh a criterion because it's, um, the, the history of modern scientific medicine is full of examples where evidence for an effect was there first and that stipulated study of the mechanisms which were eventually 
Um, so the effect was eventually proven, <coughs> and I'm, I, I would rather lean to, towards the side where it said, there, of course, there's mumbo jumbo. You have a lot of examples of obvious mumbo jumbo, but it's <coughs> in, um, there are some methods like acupuncture or manual therapy where it is currently in the process of investigation if this actually works or not. Well, we don't have to know how something works to accept it. We had no idea how penicillin worked when we started using it. Or if something is definitely proven to work, we use it, and then we go back and try to figure out how it works. Uh, the problem with homeopathy is there's no point in trying to explain the mechanism because it hasn't been proven to work in the first place. Um, Katrien Jong, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, I'm from the Dutch Society Against Quackery. Um, I want to comment on universities giving courses on homeopathy or acupuncture. If they dare to do so, they get a letter from us. Uh, and um, uh, we publish the correspondence in our magazine or on our website. Uh, some universities uh, don't want to look silly uh, and try to avoid it in the future, and some universities just don't care. <laughs> About the, um, the, the NIH, organ the CAM organization created by NIH, I know that was very troubling and it was already mentioned, um, but I was very intrigued to find out that they actually initially reached out to the skeptical community. I mean, they had a meeting, they asked Steve Novella, and I think, I don't know if you were involved in that, uh, I don't know, their, their input on, some, so, somehow they were interested in their input. Of the scientific, did, did anything come of those meetings? Or no, talks? unfortunately. Uh, Steve Novella and some other skeptics uh, met with the director of the, NI, uh, the NCCAM, and she seemed very receptive to their arguments, but right about the same time she met with a group of homeopaths and she was just as receptive to them, and we haven't seen any changes, so I, I don't think. The, see, the problem is uh, these people are political appointees, and they're trying to please the congressmen that, uh, that are pushing the NCCAM. And if they don't do what their bosses want them to do, they're in danger of losing their job. So it's going to be very difficult to change the establishment. I was reading uh, a GP's uh, column in, uh, I think it's the Times or the Sunday Times, um, and he was saying that uh, nowadays, um, the majority of pa his patients, he asks them, what do you think is wrong with you? Which is a big break from the <laughs> traditional uh, role of the doctor. Um, but only because a lot of his patients now look up their symptoms on the internet, which may not be a good idea, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it, it struck me that um, maybe doctors could advise their patients of good websites which um, discuss symptoms and also advise them um, about you know quackery and alternative medicines and the, the inadvisability of um, uh, going to um, uh, unorthodox uh, therapists. Now I have a rule of thumb that before you accept any claim you should try to find out who disagrees with it and why. And doctors could direct their patients to sites like Quackwatch or to science-based medicine. But uh, if, if you just Google for something like uh, those flower remedies, uh, you get all kinds of positive websites saying that it works. And it's, it's hard to find the skeptical voice in, in all of the, the noise. And uh, if, if, you, if you try to, for everything, there's going to be somebody out there who disagrees with it. So if you look at both sides, then you can kind of balance and say, well, which explanation makes more sense? And then you can use some judgment. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. The World Skeptics Congress, Paranormal, Supernatural, Fringe Science, Pseudoscience, and How It Really Is. We're skeptically interrogating you.